Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. It's good to see everyone who do this and protects you. Trust me. I have at least a couple of uh, confessions I should make. Number one, when I feel like I'm pressed for time, I tend to speak more rapidly than I probably should uh, just because I want to get as much out as possible. Barry Anderson told me something years ago. He said, go loaded for bear. So he always told me, go loaded for bear. But with time constraints or restraints, it's uh, a little bit more difficult for me to do that. That leads me to the second confession. Uh, that is, that I, I have notes, and those tend to keep me on track so that our timing issue is not such a problem for me. Okay, so if I look down, it's so that I won't chase <coughs> rabbits as much as I would generally do if I didn't have these time restrictions. So that's that. This is part two in reality. Uh, like Brad said, I did not expect to have the opportunity to come here and, and share with you, but last Thursday afternoon sometime, he uh, asked me if I would be willing to look at the Augsburg Confession here. And uh, had not planned it, obviously, and it put me, you know, having to dig deeper than I would have had to do uh, with something like the Knife Five Theses. Knife Five Theses are are so well known uh, and so dynamic in the uh, in the outcome that it's something we all can relate to. Augsburg Confession is a bit more complex, more complicated, because it, um, it it relates to something we don't have much contact with, and that is the concept of creed, creedalism, um, confessions things of a very formal nature that we apply ourselves to by manner of faith, okay? So, so this is a little bit more of a, uh, an issue that we have to uh, try to understand their perspective and endeavor to recognize the, the, I guess, the value in something like this, even though we have no definite connection to it, all right? Um, this is a challenge to listen to more so, so it'd be more of a challenge for me to present uh, I want to break this thing up in probably four to five different parts depending upon time. Uh, first part will be kind of providing an introduction to. Then let's look at a backdrop, historical backdrop to what's going on. Uh, we will then look at the Augsburg Confession proper, talk about the articles particularly if we can, and then provide a kind of end result or outcome to uh, what has been done. Okay. Now having said it, let's, let's introduce this idea. First of all, let me give you a website if you are interested in any way beyond what it is I have said last week and today. Let's go to www.reformed.org, all right? That's a fantastic resource that I just happened to find about three days ago. It deals with uh, Reformed theology, Reformed documentation and such. Um, deals with creeds, confessions, catechism, sermons, and other documents that I wouldn't even have time to, uh, to get into right now. So if you're looking for an interest in something like this, then you need to turn there and um, you'll have a massive historical resource that you can utilize for your future study. And by the way, something like this today is an introduction to, it, it, it skims the surface, so if you're really interested, get to that site and start doing your own study. All right, here's the introduction. 1517, with the attacking of the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg, up to 1521 provided a window of opportunity for the world to see sweeping changes that had never been known before. And with that sweeping possibility of change comes a gentleman we call you know, Martin Luther. And with that, is brought about this Protestant Reformation. All right. Now the big question is, since Martin Luther is the primary um, focal point of our attention in our study today, what's Martin Luther been up to for the last several years? Obviously, 1521 back to 1517, that four-year window, um, we have about six years between that window of opportunity up until the time the Augsburg Confession is actually given. So what's been going on for the last you know, 10 or so years, 13 years? Well, Martin Luther's been a, a busy, busy man. First thing he is, based on the um, Erasmus Greek text, he translated the Bible into a native tongue or native language of German, which is an amazing accomplishment in and of itself. Took about a year for the New Testament. Uh, 1534, the entire Bible plus the um, apocryphal books are are translated into German. So that's something Martin Luther has been done. Going up to around 15, well, let me say it like this. Martin Luther has created an awareness that has been unparalleled, you know, to that day and time. And he has become like a hero to the peasants as well as princes who would stand opposed to some of the Catholic traditionalism as well. So having said that, 1525, the peasants revolted against the governance. And with that uprising, Martin Luther has to make a determination whether he will stand for the peasant uprising or oppose it. And he happened to oppose it, losing a lot of the uh, peasant strength that had given him the ability to continue on uh, in Germany the way he had with the majority of, of you know, opinion being on his side. So when he opposes the revolt, it's based on the idea that they witnessed him take the idea 
of the Catholic Church not having supreme authority, how the Bible was the supreme authority, and then basing that, or basing their own decision on what Martin Luther did in model, they said, well, we're also being socially you know, treated incorrectly. Our finances are not what we wish they were. And so because of our opposition from the governance, we want to stand opposed to that utilizing the same model. This group of people is not in absolute authority, but God is. And God's Word teaches that we should treat people with respect and build them up, and we're not being given that, so they use the same model against the governance. And Martin Luther said, that's not what it is I intended to do. So Martin Luther has been a busy man from a practical perspective, uh, historically speaking, uh, even utilizing these kinds of ideas. Now, we also need to remember, as in, by way of introduction, that Martin Luther's um, positives or things that he has uh, contributed to us are not always doctrinal, but always or sometimes very, very practical. In the sense that he did translate the Bible into his own language, that's a big deal. Um, he also provided a, a catechism, too, by the way, a small one and a larger one. But when he provided his catechism to the people, that was a foundation upon which religious education continued on for, for literally generations. So he's, he's given us that. He also did something we can relate to, and that is congregational singing of the, entire, of the entire group. That's a big deal. Instead of having a choir or a group to do that on behalf of the church, instead now he says, let's all sing the praises to God from our hearts, and that then paved the way for a Protestant Christian piety that, um, that suggested if you take these lessons from the heart, Towards God, you can also carry them with you from day to day as you interact with other people. So that's a piety kind of idea that uh, Martin Luther also opened the door to. He married a nun. Number one, he married. That's a big deal. Number two, he married a previous nun. Number three, he had children. Those three strikes from the Catholic Church perspective also enables him to be a kind of pattern for Protestant homes in the future. So he's laid the groundwork for that. And now we come to the Augsburg Confession. Augsburg gives us an insight into his mindset as well as a, a, a kind of clarification of just how spiritually mature he was by this period of time and what he hoped to accomplish even into the future. So we look at it like that, we're now looking at the, the backdrop to what's going on. Okay, The Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, this is his name, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V has a major problem. We have the Turks that are sweeping down, the Ottoman Empire, you know, it's powerful uh, Muslim concepts okay, are sweeping down, and uh, Charles V has to make a, a decision. We've got to fight. We have to hold these guys off, and the way to do that is to get as many people on my side as possible. But we have this spiritual kind of religious rift over here in Germany, and so he goes to the Germans basically and says, I'm giving you an opportunity to share with, uh, to share with me, to share with us your views from a religious perspective. Now, by doing that, he's basically saying, hey guys, what's going on down here you know, where are you really right now? And can't we, can't we all just get along, so to speak? He's got to have as many people to fight against the Turks as possible, but he also realizes there is a religious discord going on from the Roman Catholic to the Protestant tradition, okay? Or the Protestant viewpoint in that day and time. So he wants them to share with him uh, everything they, they believe. And so that, oper that gives them opportunity to provide what we call or know as the Augsburg Confession. Now, even, even more deeply, you have to remember back in 1521, Martin Luther, during the Diet or the Gathering at Worms, has been declared as a heretic. All right. So for, from 1521 up until 1530, we look at around, what, nine or so years there when Martin Luther has been considered a heretic. He will have a price on his head. Uh, people do want to kill him. So when the, Homan, you know, the Holy Roman Emperor comes up and says, look, we want to talk, bring us your leadership, people on the Protestant side look at that and think, you know, this is, this is highly questionable. They could just be trying to trick us into drawing out Martin Luther to, to, bring him, to bring him down. So we have to be careful. The Augsburg Confession comes in a period of the second creedal period in history. Now, the first one goes from 325 with the Nicene Council, Nicene Creed, up to about 451. That's your first creedal period of history. Then you come up, though, to 1517, and they do in the dating include the Martin Luther's 95 Theses, up until around 1648. That's your second creedal period. All right? And you're going to find a sweeping amount of uh, widespread different views and beliefs that we would term as denominational backgrounds or, or documentation that, that are provided during those, that particular period of, of history. Now, what seems odd to us is that Martin Luther, on one hand, will say sola scriptura. He'll say scriptures only, Bible only. We want nothing more than the Bible. Then on the other hand, he'll say, look, we've, we've uh, concocted or created and, and you know, 
uh, transcribed into some sort of form our, our belief system. So now we have these this Augsburg Confession, and here on the other hand, Martin Luther is saying Bible only. Why is that? Practically speaking, I suppose he is under a great amount of pressure to provide some sort of uh, official statement that will help to sharply contrast a Protestant view versus the Roman Catholic traditions. So uh, he did not see an incompatibility. Okay? You have to remember he is, he is coming from a background of having studied creedal literature. All right? He sees much of the creedal literature prior to the Roman Catholic Church tradition and mindset as being definitely biblical. So by taking that up here and lifting it above, transcending beyond the Roman Catholic traditions, he sets it here now, and uh, he believes what he is doing is espousing a biblical concept. So we, we want to say, how dare you? At the very same time, he's doing something that was totally consistent with his mindset, his, his religious structure, and um, his conscience. He's not contradicting his conscience in any kind of way. This is, the Augsburg Confession is a yearning, okay, to reunite a divided Christian world. That's what this is. So you have, to, you have to view it from his own perspective. This has the positive side. The Augsburg Confession is, yes, a defense of beliefs, but it is not defiant in tone. You don't, you don't really find them saying, you Roman Catholics, ah, you know, hellbound and this and that. You don't find that. There's not that kind of defiance here. So we'll be looking at this in just a minute. But this is firmly based, firmly based on a conviction that the Bible has not been elevated up to the point that it belongs. Okay? Now, having said all that, let's go to the Augsburg Confession itself. Um, this is the primary confession of the Lutheran Church. Primary confession. So if you want to know anything about traditional Lutheranism, you would go here. Now, there have been some modifications over the years, of course, and that kind of thing. But here's your date, June 25th, 1530. All right, 1530. Just 13 years after that famous 95 Theses. This is the fourth document in the Book of Concord, which I just a moment ago uh, went out in the library, found the copy, and was looking at it with uh, Brad. The fourth document. You're wondering, what's the, what's the first three documents? Well, that would be the uh, Nicene, well, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and then the Athanasian Creed. Those are your first three. And those go way, way back. Those are ecumenical creeds that would not have been tainted by, in his opinion, the Roman Catholic traditions. So he uses those as his established basis. Then we come up with this Augsburg Confession. After that, comically almost, you find the defense of this, <laughs> which is also in the book of, of Concord. Now, let's try to see this from a religious perspective for a second, okay? Luther has left a machine. He's left a machine. Anyone in here ever seen Matrix? You know the movies, the Matrix trilogy? That's the idea. You have left something that is so considerably normal and the way it's going to be, the way things are, the things that you can't change. The question is, how do you change something that you know is wrong, but no one around you is really concerned about changing it? Martin Luther has left a machine that's been so dependent on form that suddenly it's gone. And so now you have, you, you can almost see them as this mindless kind of, of mass of people who are aimlessly wandering around trying to find some objective concept that gives them you know, stability and, and credence and, and uh, establishes them as being legitimate. That's what they're needing. And so Martin Luther steps up, and this Augsburg Confession gives them that kind of stabilization. So again, from a historical perspective, this is a, a beautiful work because of what it socially and religiously was able to actually accomplish. So here now we have the formal composition. Formal composition fell to Martin Luther. However, the scribe, so to speak, the guy who gave this its backbone was Melanchthon. All right, now I'm not gonna, I got about four other names we could go through. I had a hard time trying to figure out what to and what not to say in this, but then you've got, you got Melanchthon. He arranges this thing. Luther is the brain. He is the inspiration for this. Melanchthon, however, stabilizes this foundation. And then we come up to the Augsburg Confession. You talk about a real, true, dynamic duo. This is it. Now, it's considered beautiful literature, particularly, of course, by the Lutheran Church, but also by the, uh, by the idea of, of just what it accomplished. It is, by the way, consistent and true to the church fathers. It is consistent and true to what he believed to be true Roman Catholic teaching. He believes this Augsburg Confession to also be consistent with Scripture. And at the very same time, it provides a clear, mark of, or a clear demarcation zone that says, here we are, here they are. And if you choose to come down on the side of objective, absolute, you know, not, objective truth, then you can, of course, come along to our side as well as the fact that this is written for ministers in the church, 
as well as lay people. That's the beauty of this. It's not held back and only the bishops can have this. It's given to everybody so they can know something more clearly, something more intently defined regarding God. Now, let's look particularly at the Augsburg Confession. You've got a, the, it's two parts. You've got the positives and the negatives. The negatives are smaller. They're on to the end, and they deal with um, the particular, I guess, um, disputes they have with the Roman Catholic tradition. We'll talk about some of those in a second. The first thing is, though, the positives. Positives would be things like they point out commonalities with the Roman Catholic Church, how they do stand against Pelagianism, Donatism. We can look at those another time, maybe. Um, they're opposing themselves to Roman, uh, Rome on faith rights. There is a, a, well, we won't get into that either, but faith rights was a distinction. They had a distinction with Anabaptists as well as Zwinglians. Now, Ulrich Zwingli, we might find ourselves coming down on his side you know, more than even Martin Luther. Uh, but anyway, those Anabaptists were the guys who wouldn't, how dare they not baptize children? Because they believe children are free from sin because they've not reached an age of accountability. And Luther would say, how dare they do that? That's not consistent with Roman Catholic teachings, nor what he believes Scripture taught about original sin. Okay, so you have those kinds of things going on here uh, in that. As far as negatives, abuses of the Roman Catholic Church, one would be withholding the cup. You ever seen on some of these movies that deal with historical Catholicism? They will show you know, the, the, the people coming to the, the, uh, the, the bishop, and he will hold out the, 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 you know, the Corpus Christi, the body of, of Christ. And they would lay it on the top of the tongue of the individual. He would then have the body of Christ. He would go about, you know, leave from there. They would withhold the blood of Christ. You see that sometimes coming up in movies. This is something Martin Luther said. That shouldn't happen. You know, he goes back to the ideas of Matthew and others that talk about the Lord's Supper and how it's, it's the emblems that define for us the beauty of Christ or God's sacrifice through the Lamb of God. So why would you withhold one? Unless you're just trying to you know, do something spiritually deviant. So he, he stands opposed to that idea. Also, compulsory confession. Uh, you've got to confess a certain amount of times, a certain amount of days, every single year. And that what, what he said is it produces a kind of ri rigid formalism that isn't really heartfelt. Okay, so you've got to do something this way. And he says that's not the way we, we want to look at this. We want it to be a heartfelt, natural kind of um, bubbling up from the springs of your heart that say, I want God to be glorified. My life is not consistent with His will right now. He also talked about how that many of the bishops lacked a spirituality, and that was a detriment to the spiritual development of the churches. All right, That's what you find here in the Augsburg Confession. And I hope that will help you know, provide for you some foundation upon which to build your own base of knowledge. Now, here, let me, let me give you this. I understand and recognize that we talk so much about anti-creed, anti-creedalism, anti-confessionalism, and such of that nature. I wrote this stuff down, so I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up, okay? These are, of course, my own thoughts, but a statement of intention and a statement for clarification, to me, is not an issue. Now, I'm going to give you why. I know a couple of heads are like, what? What is it saying? It's not the issue. The issue is when we dictate our statement as, as absolute. Okay, that's a problem. And therein is a, a key failure. I'm not going to talk about creeds particularly. I'm talking about the concept of this idea. Um, the statement then, which is intended to unite, can actually be very divisive. It can actually divide. Okay? Now, i got something to say on creeds. Not going to for time and for the proverbial can of worms. But if a thing is absolute, it assumes to be correct. Does it not? If a thing is considered absolute, and we say this is absolute, it is considered to then be correct. If something is correct, then it is without error, without problem. No merely human document can ever assume to be absolutely correct. Follow me? That's the second little line up here. Because if a person ever comes up in a generation from now and looks to that document and then has some cause for concern, raises some question about the validity of its statement, then it automatically casts doubt against the document itself. See the idea? So if there's doubt cast... It cannot be fallible from that perspective within the context of what we're dealing with here. It cannot be fall uh, infallible that way. It is fallible because it's not absolute. And so you're dealing with a circular kind of reasoning here that people assume something that is not necessarily the case. And if they state it as being absolute, then we have a problem because it divides instead of unites, which the intention is to unite in the first place. Right, so we follow that that. You cannot say human documents are absolute. We can hold God's word up as absolute. The principles, the concepts there have been consistent from the beginning and will be continuing through the end and into eternity. 
So those are things we can hold on to as absolute. So I prefer then to stand up as a member of the Lord's Church, as a minister of the Gospel of Christ, and say, here's what we stand for. Here's what we stand for. This is what we teach. Here's what we explain. Now, I realize Paul said to Timothy, you know, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. You've got two negatives and one positive there. But I think it's a beautiful concept, especially in our day and time, if we're able to stand firmly upon what we know, what is beautifully the case, and what allows us to live our Christianity out in such a joy-filled way that the world sees something positive streaming from our hearts and lives, and we're not so you know, concerned about the barrage of negativity that pulls our spiritual essence down because we're always trying to defend something that we already have taken as fact. We're holding up something that's beautiful instead of having to knit, you know, having the constant debate about some namby pamby insignificant concept that we learned 60 years ago that's still some issue to somebody in the year 2012. All right, so keep keep that kind of thing in mind. I, I prefer that kind of thing. Now, as far I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you my uh, outcome really quick. If we have time to look at a couple of the uh, statements or articles, we'll do that. I apologize for. Maybe chasing a rat. Anyway, many people embraced the Augsburg Confession. They held on to it and said, woohoo, this is a great document. We love it. However, who do you think refuted the idea? Well, the Roman Catholic Church. They said, we don't like it. It's not good. We hate it. And so that then led us to Melanchthon's apology or the apologia, the defense of the Augsburg Confession, which came out one year later. And by the way, you have 95 theses, very, very small. You have the Augsburg Confession, substantially bigger. You have the defense of the Augsburg Confession, which is huge <laughs> by comparison. So what we're dealing with here is a pro we would call we would call it almost um, you know a, a debatable progression. They debate about everything; it becomes kind of convoluted and it's a mess and all that. But uh, that's what you see when you when you, when you term something as progress. You see the constant debate that comes from it, and it, it seems to grow and grow. Now, to Martin Luther's credit, my little tangent while I go, maybe. Martin Luther's credit is he always kept his documents under constant scrutiny. So I do appreciate that, okay? He did not come up and say these articles of the Augsburg Confession are absolute statements that will never change. All right, please keep that in mind. So I have to, you have to give some applause to Martin Luther's past, okay? He's done that. Now, I will say this. If you talk to a Lutheran today, they're probably not going to be such, okay, such a way. They're going to hold on to this because they've had 500 years nearly of, of Reformed tradition. They're going to hold to that tradition as being an absolute context within which their Lutheran concepts continue to materialize and, and flourish. All right? So keep that in mind, too. Um, but you cannot, you cannot read the Augsburg Confession without appreciating the sincerity of heart that Martin Luther had. You can't do it. This is a, it's a beautiful piece of literature in and of itself. You have, uh, you have what he believed to be spiritual essentials here. Um, as well as what he believed to be uh, biblically relevant ideals for that damn time. So I know that what we, I know how we do things. I know that we look at things with a very judgmental eye. We automatically say, well, this doesn't even count because it's a creed or a confession, you know, and all this kind of thing. But let me tell you what, as far as the value is concerned in a historical document that has led to a, a strong reformed tradition in the United States of America, even, and throughout the entire world, you got to hold on to a certain you know, grain of, of potential. This is the historic standard for 500 years of religious belief. And we have been, by the way, affected by that. Regarding the concepts of the piety I dealt with and the congregational sin, who brought that up? Martin Luther did. Otherwise, we'd still have choirs doing it for us. See the ideas? So we're dealing with something here that is a powerful historical Christian document. Christian, of course, being in quotation marks there. Do I have two whole minutes? Do I have two minutes? Went through here last night and read through this. The, the introduction itself is a beautiful, beautiful writing. Uh, very pro emperor choice. You know, we want we want to be with you. We want to help you along the way. Um, listen, to this that as we all are under one Christ and do battle under Him, so we may be able also to live in unity and concord in the one true Christian church. It's a pretty nice statement. That was that was clarifying what their belief was towards an end result. Um, they're, they're not presuming to be boastful, but very humble in what they're expressing here. They also wrote this in German as well as Latin, which was almost unheard of again. The Holy Catholic Church language was Latin, so the upper echelon of the hierarchy could understand what the code was, and they could then dictate to the masses of people what they should know about what was being said. Luther said this is for the Latin you know, speaking group as well as the common people. And um, you have to take a big, deep breath for a lot of this. I found about about two or three that would be considered paragraphs. I should have had a lot of periods in there. One big run-on sentence. You found a lot of that. 
Let me, um, you know what? Yeah, I just, I just don't know here what I want to share. There's just so much. I guess part three next week. No, I'm just, just joking here. Let me read this one to you here regarding the Son of God. Then I will, I will stop. So let me just read this one to you. Also, they being Lutheran or being those of the Protestant movement, also we teach that the Word, that is the Son of God, it assumed the human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that there are two natures, the divine and the human, inseparably enjoined in one person. One Christ, true God, true man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, truly suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried, that he might reconcile the Father unto us and be a sacrifice not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of men. He also descended and truly arose again the third day. Afterward, he ascended into heaven that he might sit on the right hand of the Father and forever reign and have dominion over all creatures and sanctify them that believe in him by sending the Holy Ghost into their hearts to rule, comfort, and quicken them and to defend them against the devil and the power of sin. And for the most part, would we agree? Yeah. Is it beautiful that, that 500 years ago people were saying, this is what we believe about what the Bible says? Yeah, it's beautiful. So, so look at things with, yes, objective, yes, biblical eyes, but also... Uh, be, be critical in your evaluations. And being critical of evalu during your evaluation requires you to have a certain understanding of the constructs, mindset, culture of that day, and what's actually happening to bring something like this about. That's what makes this such a beautiful document and something we can, you can, we can relate to, not only religiously, but also as, as students, as uh, those who are concerned about the academic world. We want to have a relevant view of what has been established in, in times past. So I appreciate you listening. Hopefully this opens you up at least to uh, appreciating something that we don't generally talk too much about.